Continuing on on our discussion on the forgotten remedy, and you know that's what it's often called, the forgotten remedy, and that is exercise. God designed that this living machinery be in daily activity, and then that activity is its preserving power. So I always thought I didn't need to exercise because I was always busy. I was always busy doing this here and there. And then I went to New Zealand, and this is 18 years ago now, I still had a couple of kids at home, they were teenagers. So I would get up early, I'd always have my prayer and study, I'd put the wash on, I'd put the breakfast on, then I'd wake the children. But when I went to New Zealand, I didn't have to do all that. And the lady I stayed with, she was about 10 years younger than me, she was maybe twice my weight. She said, Barbara, I go on a 5K walk every morning, do you want to join me? And I said, I'd love to. Halfway along the 5k walk, I found I couldn't keep up with her. But I tried very hard to, and I was a bit embarrassed because I'm the health teacher and I can't keep up with her and she's twice my weight. <laughs> the next day when I woke up, I could hardly move. My muscles were so <laughs> sore. She said, are you coming this morning? And I said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm the health teacher. <laughs> she had another friend with her that day. They were just way ahead of me the whole time. And I learnt my lesson. I said, Father in heaven, I'm listening. <laughs> Being busy all day is not enough. And how many people use that as an excuse not to exercise? So when I went home, I thought, I I'm going to continue this. I didn't go through all this, that pain for nothing. <laughs> and so I implemented a half hour exercise program. It was a walk. Now I always used to have cold feet, always used to get cold feet. And I used to often sit on the ensuite basin with my feet in a little bit of hot water to warm them up before I went to bed. When I started the exercise program, that stopped. And the only way I could fit it in was doing it at 5.30 in the morning because I had to wake the children at 6 and, you know, the day started. And so I did it 5.30 to 6 and it was always dark because it was down the bottom of Australia. And you know, when in the southern hemisphere, the further down you go, the, the earlier it gets dark. Same with up, up the top where you are. So I almost always walked in the dark. But do you know what I found? Once you get out there, your eyes adjust. Even when there's not a big moon like now. I'm sure you don't have that problem here at the moment. I get up to the bathroom in the middle of the night and it's midnight. I look outside and it looks like there's dusk. It's <laughs> still. I thought, I could garden in this light. Does it ever get dark in the summer at all? I suppose you're asleep when it might. it might. I don't know, one or two in the morning it might. But then four in the morning, is, <laughs> it's very light again. But down in Melbourne, it was very dark. When I left home, I, I always had a scarf, a beanie and gloves on. When I came back into the house, the, the scarf's off, the beanie's off, the gloves are off. What's happened? Now, I didn't know about the high-intensity interval training then. I used to do a half-hour walk and there was a bit of a hill, so I was actually getting a bit of a, a workout. My friend Jonathan Gibbs, who's got PhD, three PhDs, and he lives in Los Angeles, he said, one of my PhDs was the effect of exercise on the cell, and I can tell you exactly what's happening. He said, when you do that in the morning, a network of capillaries is opened that equals the distance around planet Earth. Wow, that's an amazing piece of information, isn't it? And that's, when you do that exercise in the morning, a network of capillaries is opened that equals the distance around planet Earth. Now that's referring to all the extremities, all those tiny, tiny little capillaries. That's in the brain, that's in the eyes, that's in your hearing. Do you know what that means? Your eyesight improves, your hearing improves. <laughs> and what happened to me was no more cold feet. No more cold feet. And it was because of what I was doing in the morning. And I'm sure Michael used to have a look at 
the transformation in me and decided to join me. <laughs> and he always walks with me now. But since we've got the interval training, because Michael and I, we've got a lot happening in the day. We're very busy people. Oh, 15 minutes is very attractive. <laughs> so we cut it down from half an hour to 15 minutes. It's intense. It's incredibly intense. But that's its power. That's where the power lies. But the good news is it's not for long. It's only for 30 seconds. 30 seconds doesn't sound long, does it? Well, it is when, when you're running for your life. <laughs> and if you can't quite get up to 30, just do your 20. In the book Pace, Al Sears' book, this is the title of the book, Progressive Acceleration Cardiopulmonary Exertion. I'll go through it slowly. It's progressive. What you can't do now, you will do. And he also talks about the interval training. Progressive acceleration. You are moving. This is no gentle stroll. In fact, when Michael and I are doing the 30 seconds, uh, we're not talking then. We talk when we're, do when we're in recovery time. And I think Michael must love exercising with me because he just shoots ahead of me like Usain Bolt because his legs are four inches longer than mine. That's, <laughs> that's my excuse that I can't keep up with him. You're working, you're working hard, so that's the acceleration. Cardiopulmonary, cardio referring to heart muscle. The heart is a muscle, and like any muscle, it can be strengthened and it can be weakened. So one of my favorite stories about illustration that is my son Peter. My son Peter's a tyler and this is when he was about 25 and he um, was training for a triathlon. So he was running up and down the hills every evening behind Brisbane, lots of hills behind Brisbane. But about that time he was renovating a bathroom and there was an old 50s uh, vanity unit that had a big chip out of the side. And he was getting it out very heavy and it slipped and hit his ankle. And I think if he hadn't had a bone there, it might have just taken his foot off. And the blood hit the roof. And he called out to my elder son, James, James, I need help. And apparently James said, I'm on the phone, mate. <laughs> now I'm telling you this to show you that it was a few minutes before James got into the room. And apparently Peter said, crisis, or something like that. James ran in and James said, the whole of the roof was splattered with blood. <laughs> was this lovely array of blood. Why? Well, Peter's resting heart rate, it was about, uh, I think it was 50 beats per minute. When you've got a heart rate of 50 beats per minute, it is so efficient, it is so strong, it is so effective, it doesn't have to beat much because every beat just goes boom. If Peter's resting heart rate had been 80 beats per minute, I think the blood would have only just got up the wall. But because his resting heart rate was so strong, it shot right up to the ceiling. Anyway, James quickly bound it and took him to the hospital. And there was a nurse there about to un, unbandage it. And apparently the doctor said, I wouldn't do that because <laughs> he knew. But the nurse kept taking Peter's pulse. She just couldn't believe it. 50 beats per minute? You don't get many like that in hospital, do you? In fact, a lady just emailed me and she said, her husband went in the hospital for some sort of checkup, and his resting heart rate was 46 beats per minute. And, and the doctor said, oh, you've got to go on some medication. That's too low. And then the guy reminded him, I'm ultra fit. <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> yes, and he was ultra fit. And the doctor went, ah, ah yeah, yeah. <laughs> So that's what exercise does. It strengthens your heart. So end of Peter's story is, no, he didn't run in the triathlon. <laughs> and when the doctor was stitching, he kept getting Peter to, to move his toes up and down. He couldn't believe that it had missed the tendon to the big toe. 
So when he was telling me this, I said, Peter, it's your mother's prayers. <laughs> it's your mother's prayers. Every day your mother's on her knees praying for you and your life. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Have you read in uh, Adventist Home where Ellen White says that, that, that praying mother, those praying parents, when they're praying fervently for their children, they can be almost into temptation and it can help to bring them back. Isn't that a beautiful thought? Power of prayer. So cardio, so progressive acceleration of cardiopulmonary. If your heart is not strong, it can get strong by daily exercise. Cardiopulmonary. What's pulmonary? That's lungs. The Framingham Heart Study, I've mentioned it a couple of times, interesting study, because uh, it's not funded by the pharmaceutical company or the dairy industry or the meat industry or the grain industry. It's a little town of Framingham and it's been going for nearly 40 years now and I think there's about 30,000 people that are on the, on the books. Some die, more come on. So it's a fairly accurate study of overall health. And they set up this study to prove that cholesterol causes heart disease, but, but it actually didn't. They're even finding people with low cholesterol levels having heart attacks. We had a lady come to us from the UK. She was 40. She just had a heart attack. She said, they did an angiogram on me and my arteries were clear. Why did she have a heart attack? She was, we, we went through this with her. Hardly any sleep. <laughs> Where's sleep? No exercise. No water because she was too busy to, to go to the toilet. And high stress. High stress can constrict those those little capillaries and can just tip the scales. So back to the Framingham Heart Study. The Framingham Heart Study has showed that people with high cholesterol levels don't get Alzheimer's. Isn't that an interesting piece of information? People with high cholesterol levels don't get Alzheimer's because what is the brain? Yes. Fat. <laughs> what does the brain love? Fat. It's a protection for the brain. Fat protects the brain against a lot of harmful pathogens and uh, chemicals and heavy metals. What the Framingham Heart Study showed is that by the age of, by the age of 60, most people had lost 50% lung capacity. By the age of 60, lost 50% lung capacity. By the age of 80, they'd lost 60% lung capacity. Why? Because the lungs never move. When you do the high intensity interval training, you're breathing very, very deeply. Very, very deeply. You're using your whole lung capacity. And if you do that every day, you will never lose lung capacity. And if you've lost it and do that every day, you will regain it. Isn't that good news? Yeah? Can you increase the capacity of the lungs with a cayenne? Uh, yeah, a little bit, but nothing does what the exercise does. In fact, one lady said to me, Barbara, um, what can I do about my circulation other than exercise? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, cayenne pepper does a bit, but it will not do what exercise does. That's why, remember, these are the true remedies. You just got to find out how to fit it into your day. You just got to find out how to do it, where to do it, and what suits you. Why is it best to do it in the morning? Why is it best to do it in the morning? It's a good question because you will reap the benefits physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually all through the day. Do you remember the network of capillaries that equals the distance around planet Earth? Do you know where a lot of those capillaries are? In your mind. All of those tiny little capillaries. And when you exercise regularly like this, the, the body actually creates more capillaries. Isn't that incredible? And when you stop exercising, those little capillaries, some of them can start closing down. 
Now, do you remember we looked at uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1? Seeing then that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Remember, your cells are witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily, easily beset us. And exercise moves the life of the flesh. It moves the blood. So that means more oxygen, more nutrients, more water, right into the brain, into the extremities. And then the next verse says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the, the shame. And he sat down at the right hand of the Father. But I want to go back again. It says, seeing then that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and run with patience the race set before us. And I'm sure we all know very well the verse about the race. And the race where Paul is talking about the Greek games is found in uh, 2 Corinthians no, it's 1 Corinthians. Do you know how I remember that? Most people want to come first in a race. 1 Corinthians. Um, I think it's uh, 9, 9.25, where it says, Know you not that they that run in a race run all, but one receives the prize. Therefore so run that you may receive. Every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, but not as uncertainly. So fight I, but not as one that beats the air. I keep under my body and I bring it into subjection. If by any means when I have preached to others, I myself might be a castaway. Do you remember on Saturday morning I talked about the dialogue that happens every day between our prefrontal cortex and our thoughts and our feelings? And you watch, you watch, you wake up in the morning and your feelings will say to you, oh, you don't have to exercise. Mm -hmm. I keep under my body, I bring it into subjection. You're going. <laughs> <laughs> You're going. <laughs> You're going. Have you ever had a look at those games? And when the Bible says... Um, that only one receives the prize. You know what the prize was back then? It was a wreath that was woven out of um, vines. So it deteriorated in the day. Now, they're, they're, they, they pay them a bit better nowadays, don't they? <laughs> I think the rewards are a little much more than that. So it says, I therefore so run, but not as uncertainly. In this race, everyone can receive the prize. And the prize is eternal life. And we can hasten the soon coming of our Lord and Saviour by being fit, healthy and able to work for God. Isn't that true? God's work suffers because the saints are sick. And a lot of them are sick through lack of knowledge. The only hope of better things is the education of people in right principles. Have you ever had a look at the training program that the Olympic athletes go through? Incredible. Every man that strives for the mastery. What, are they, what mastery are they striving for? They're striving for the mastery of the body. They train it and train it and train it and train it. Because they want to win. Isn't that true? Of course they want to win. So every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. So here's our temperance, very important law of the health. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, but not as uncertainly. So fight I, but not as one that beats the air. I keep under my body and I bring it into subjection. As I said to you, the first few days here when my body was screaming at me at 7.30 and 8, because I usually ate, ate, remember what I said? Settle down. I keep under my body and I brought it into subjection. 
<laughs> if by any means when I have preached to others, I myself might be a castaway. So God was very gracious to teach me the importance of exercise graciously. And I began to implement it. And when I started to do the high intensity, that was even more exciting and certainly harder. But it is more powerful. And you almost think to yourself, is it doing anything? It's just so little. And the test came when I was in New Zealand. And I'm up in the hills in New Zealand. I'm uh, in a homeschool camp and there's about... Oh, they look like there are about 100 kids there. <laughs> but I'm speaking mostly to parents and the children have other meetings. And one afternoon they decided to go on a walk, which I was keen to do. Um, they were up in the hills, so this walk went along and then went down a, quite a big cl cliff. And it was sort of swinging from trees. You'd grab the trees and swing down. It wasn't quite like that. It was a little bit of a slope. And then it came down to a beautiful um, creek. Do you call it a creek? Brook? Stream? Stream? Is that what you call it? We call it a creek in Australia. A stream? And it was just so lovely and we had to climb over these big boulders. I got to the point where I just decided to walk in the water. <laughs> Shoes and everything on. And then I, I was watching them and I was following them and there was the man and he, the man's about 40 and he's teenagers. And we got right up the top to this incredible waterfall. And that was very beautiful. And they came and said, you're the oldest person that's ever been up here. <laughs> <laughs> they kept looking around. They didn't think I'd keep up with them. And I said, this took quite a long, a long time to get here. I said, I've got a meeting in an hour. I better go. So I had to just about run back. And then when it was time to go up this steep, it's just pulling from tree to tree to tree to tree to tree. And then I got into the forest and I ran because I do not like to be late. My husband says, it's all right. They won't start without you. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was able to run in, have a quick shower, get dressed. And they were planning another meeting because they thought there's no way she'll be back on time. Now, the next day, I thought, I'm going to suffer because <laughs> I pushed myself to the limit. No sore muscles. No sore muscles at all. And that's when I realized the power of this high-intensity interval training. It's powerful. But it is important to warm up because I gave this presentation at our health centre once and we had a break. And a man and a lady ran outside, ran up the hill, and he, his Achilles tendon snapped. Ooh. <laughs> so warming up's very important. <laughs> the warming up's important. Question? Yeah. For these 20 seconds, it's always to run, or, or can I jump as well? Just the pulse has to get yeah. up yeah. Yeah. high. So I yeah. can jump, I can... You can jump, but I'm about to show you something that's the best. And... This is the rebounder. So the rebounder is a trampoline. And I was um, reading a book by Albert Carter. And it was interesting how God gave me this book. I was in a doctor's office because when I run the retreat in Denver, Colorado, um, I, I do all my consultations in the doctor's office and he has a week's break. And this lady, she was to be a cons have a consult with me at three o'clock and it's quarter past three, she's not there. So I, I, I love reading, I'm an avid reader. And I found this book, Rebounding by Albert Carter and it looks like it was written about the 80s. And I didn't realise that there, you know, it was another 15 minutes before the lady came, so I had read quite a bit of it. I took it home and read more. I could not put this book down. It was so fascinating. I was interested in his story. Albert Carter was an Olympian trampolinist. And when he married and had children, he and his wife used to do a trampoline show with the kids. And 
he, he was very fit. You could count, count his abs on his stomach and his muscles were like this. He didn't do any bodybuilding. All he did was trampolining. That's all he did. And he noticed his little four-year-old girl, she could do one-arm push-ups. She was so strong. And his little boy was only a skinny little thing. He was seven. But if anybody at school challenged him, he challenged them to push-ups. And no one could keep up to his thousand push-ups. So Albert Carter said, why are my kids so strong? I don't know whether he ever looked in the mirror, but, you know, he was, <laughs> he, was fairly, he was fairly big. And so he began to investigate. I just love it when people put their detective hat on. And he found that there was not much, so this is in the early 80s, there was not much information on trampolines. And then he went to NASA. And what he found with NASA was that that they were discovering that they're athletes and they're very fit. They have to be very fit to go out of space. And they're out of space for, say, two weeks. And when they come back, he said, sometimes they've lost 25% muscle and bone loss because in outer space there's no gravity. And strength comes by defying gravity. And what they found was... There was only one type of exercise that prepared them for that and there was only one type of exercise that got their muscle and bone mass back very quickly and that was trampolining. In fact, if they trampolined to exercise before they went, the loss wasn't as much. And when they came back, if they trampolined, they regained their loss quicker than any other type of exercise. And... This is what Albert Carter found, that the reason why the trampolining or the little rebounders, in fact, he was so excited when he discovered the little ones. In fact, he's got a fold-up one that he takes everywhere with him. So I got his more recent book, which was, I think, 2014, and he's an older man there. He'd be, I don't know, nearly 80s now. But the pictures of the strong young man is his son. <laughs> so... This is what he found, that there are three forces that come together with rebounding. <clears throat> there is the defying gravity, that's definitely a force. And the other force is acceleration. So when you are leaping off the mat, you are accelerating up into the air and then you hit the peak of your jump and you decelerate. And then when you start coming down, you're accelerating again and then you hit the mat, you've got deceleration. So these three forces come together and he found in Einstein, Einstein said, this has the same effect on the human body. There is no other exercise that affects every single cell in the body. And when you're continually going up, down, up, down, every time you hit the mat, I was going to say there's a jarring, but there is not a jarring. And that's one of the beauties of it, is that when you hit the mat, you spring up again. And so it's excellent exercise for hips, knees and ankles. And what Albert Carter said, he had some... Uh, runners and they've been running for 20 years and their ankles and their knees and their hips are suffering from the jarring of running so he put them over onto the rebounder he said within a matter of months he said the difference was huge they retained their fitness they even increased their fitness and yet they didn't have that jarring but when you hit the mat there's a almost a jolt in the body where every cell Every cell reacts to that. There's no other exercise that has this effect on every cell. And what you're doing is you're challenging every cell to get stronger and stronger and stronger to cope with this, with these three movements. The lymphatic system is particularly stimulated with rebounding. So the lymphatic system has little gates all along the little canals and those gates are shut when we wake up in the morning 
And when we start moving, a few of them open. But when you rebound, every gate opens. And this is what Albert Carter shows, that when you leap off the mat and you're, you're up to the peak of your jump, every gate opens. And when you hit the mat, every gate closes. And when you're up in the air again, every gate opens. And when you hit the mat, every gate closes. So can you see this pumping system? And the pumping system is very important because your lymphatic system is your body's vacuum cleaner. So it's the vacuum cleaner. And what does a vacuum cleaner do? It's, it, it cleans up the waste in the body. And one of the reasons there are so many diseases today is because of build up waste in the body and then the body's own microorganisms are coming to clean up the waste. We've got a, we live in a self-healing, self-cleansing organism. So this rebounding, stimulating the lymphatic system, your body's constantly cleaning. And then the waste from the lymphatic system as it sweeps away the waste from the tissue it dumps it into the lymph nodes which dumps the waste into the blood and then you sweat it out urinate it out comes out via your colon that's the amazing process that God put in the body yeah I just wonder how can this trampolining or rebounding be high intensive because you keep on doing this for hours I think it, it's the higher you jump, the more strenuous it is. And my son, he jogs on it. He jogged on it so much one day I've got a dent in my wooden floor <laughs> of one of the <laughs> I said, Peter. <laughs> it's all right, Mum. <laughs> yeah, you, you can certainly get, uh, in fact, if I'm on the rebounder leaping very, very high, when I'm off, I'm, I'm breathing like this. The higher you leap, the, the, um, the more intense it gets. Or you can jog. Jogging really gets it intense. Is there a difference between a rebound and a trampoline? Not really. So mm -hmm. it can be also like yeah. three meters in value. Yeah, but I just find that if you've got a rebounder in your house, you'll do it more. And a lot of people have the trampoline, but they just never get out there. <laughs> And if you've got a trampoline in your house, where are the kids? I came to the conclusion after studying this that the reason people get old is they stop jumping. What's the old saying? We should jump for joy. You look at children, they're constantly defying gravity. I know my newborn babies, they try and put their head up, try and put their head up. And then they try and push themselves up to crawl. And then they're pulling themselves up on, on furniture. And then they're in the cot and they're jumping, jumping up and down. Yeah? <coughs> but uh, <coughs> if you have it inside, uh, if, if you can just jump like 20 centimeters or something like that, is that enough? Yes, yes, yeah. Okay. That's quite good. If you're not used to it, remember, start with the health bounce, which is mm -hmm. just, just a little bit and then ease ease up to it. It can improve your eyesight. So what I do on my rebounder is I've got a veranda. I suppose in Australia we, we nearly always have verandas because we don't have snow. And I think that's why you don't have many verandas here because of the snow. So I've got hanging pot plants and what I'll do is as I'm rebounding I'll focus on the pot plant and I've got big pine trees, uh, not right near my house, but down on the edge near the road. So what I'll do is I'll, cons I'll focus on the pot plant, 10 jumps, and then I'll focus on the, on the pine tree. When I'm focusing on the pot plant, the pine trees are leaping in my peripheral vision like this. And then I focus on the pine tree, and then in my peripheral vision, the the pot plant's jumping up and down. Can you see what you're doing? You're, you're, you're swapping between short and long range to strengthen the muscles in your eyes. And Anna guest told me this. She's got a friend who's a watchmaker, and he's about 40. And she noticed one day he started wearing glasses. 
She said, you're wearing glasses. He said, yeah, I, I, I need it. You know, I found that I'm starting to need it for my focus. She showed him two months later and he's there working with no glasses on. She said, what happened to your glasses? He said, I started rebounding. Mm. And he said, I started changing my focus. And she, he said, my eye, eyesight has improved. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So I'm in my late 60s and what I find is that I have glasses for fine print but my eyesight has not deteriorated in the last 40 years. So this writing here I was reading this morning. Now if I really want to read it quickly I'll, uh, I'll get glasses. Now see how fine that is? That's quite fine. The nurse came swiftly. I knew it by the number of children in the, in the hall next to the door. See that? I, I can read it. You memorised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I might have just made that up, mightn't I? <laughs> so remember who you experiment on the bet is yourself. That's, that's where you start because they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, your testimony. Now, when you start presenting these principles, it's perfectly all right to say, Barbara's got a story about this, Barbara's got a story about that. That's perfectly fine. And you see that, you know, sometimes I do that, but what's the most powerful is what you have found out f for yourself, what this, has, what this has done for me. What about your biceps and your triceps? Well, I do, I do 10 jumps with my arms up like that. That's the, that strengthens the uh, biceps. And then I have my palms out. How I remember what's what, I, I think of that thumb as the top of the T, triceps. And then I do 10 jumps for the triceps because upper body is, is very important. Will this strengthen your core? Absolutely. One lady said, I, I don't like rebounding because, you know, I feel to urinate when I get on. I said, that tells you that it's that very muscle that's being strengthened. Just empty your bladder before you get on the rebounder. The good news is you only need to do three minutes three times a day. That's not much, is it? But if you wanted to bring this into your high intensity, absolutely. You just leap very high or you would uh, jog jog on the rebounder and you might need you might find 60 seconds will get it up a little bit more so you, you'd, you'd play with that yeah would it also help with the brain for example when people are beginning to become get alzheimer oh yes very very much mm -hmm. very much it, because remember the network of capillaries that equals the distance around planet earth that that's where it's going to all of those little fine capillaries I draw this as if there's one energy cycle per cell, but there's actually hundreds. And when someone starts exercising and their body needs more energy and more fuel, the body can develop more. They're called the little mitochondria. That's the Krebs cycle in the mitochondria. That's quite phenomenal, isn't it? So many things about the human body, it's hard to get the mind around because they're so incredible. Yes? Otherwise, back to the sort of base question about um, exercise. If you're doing walking, um, it's enough to just walk faster, right? You don't have to run. Well, yeah, you need a hill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because you don't really get the high intensity. And when I was in Mount Isa, have you heard of Mount Isa? It's sort of... Uh, way out in the desert, but up near the top of Australia, it's where they do a lot of mining. So I was there to give meetings. And so I went out on my morning walk looking for a hill and I found these strange mounds. They're, they're like that, they're very steep. So I'm about this big. And I think they must be maybe the dirt that comes out of the mines, but there's these all these big hills because it's flat everywhere else. So I would walk up there Oh, by then I'm really working hard. So then I'd stop and I'd, um, you know, I'd do other stretches. So 
I was not running. <laughs> I was walking, but up a steep, steep hill, and then I'd get two lots of high intensity when I came to the hill. So if you are just walking, then when you get to the hill, you just walk very, very fast, very, very fast up the hill. And swimming, you can certainly get high intensity. We've been watching Lydia do um, butterfly stroke. I'm sure Lydia gets high intensity doing butterfly stroke. Oh, yes. I can't do butterfly stroke. <laughs> I've had some major injuries to both my shoulders, but they both work. They both work, and I'm very happy that they're, they're working. And I might be able to build up to butterfly stroke. But you, you had to build up to it, didn't you? I think you were telling me. Yeah. And you remember the story I told you earlier in the week about a lady in uh, the retreat in, in Manchester recently. She got a rebounder, and she's the lady that got a lot of nerve damage from being on antidepressants for about 30 years. So at times she, she shakes and she said that when she started on the rebounder, she started with 10 seconds. That's, that's all she could do. She said, I'm up to 15 minutes now. And you certainly can do 15 minutes. A lady said to me that her little, her little four-year-old boy, he's playing with Lego. Do you have Lego? Ah, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, well, all the knives. I guess it's universal. He's playing, he's playing, oh really? He's playing with Lego on the floor and she's in the kitchen and she watched him. She said about every 10 minutes he jumps up, gets on the rebounder and leaps away for a few minutes and then comes back and plays with Lego again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'd like to mention one more thing and that is footwear and clothes. So footwear is very important. And I read a book called Born to Run by Christopher McDougall. And this guy was a runner and he was getting a lot of hamstring problems, lower back, hip problems, pelvic problems. So he decided to take six months off work, travel the world and interview runners. And he interviewed a lot of runners in that time, of course, and also looked at history on different runners. And when he looked at the Olympic Games, he discovered Abibi Bakila. I don't know if you've heard of Abibi Bakila. Abibi Bakila was an African runner who took home gold in 1960 and 1964 Olympic Games, barefoot runner. A barefoot runner. And you will find that when you run barefoot, you will always run on your toes. You will never run on your heel. Your toes were designed to take the weight, to cushion the weight, to have like a shock absorb effect on the whole body. Your heel was not designed to take the weight. But you have a look at most joggers today, they're designed for heel striking. And I was talking to a friend of mine, you know, he's in his 50s, he said, when I was at school, we had to, we had to heel strike if we were running. But he said, they've changed it now. <laughs> Now there's toe striking. Can you see the great deceivers even come into the joggers? <laughs> the runners that people have? <coughs> when I read this book, it really opened my eyes. The guy's an atheist that wrote the book. And, one of, uh, and our exercise coordinator, I was telling him about it. And he, he said to me, I don't, you shouldn't put this book in the health centre. It's so much evolution in there. And I thought, is there? But then I realised that when I come to anything like that, I speed read. And I just, I just sort of speed read it, oh, not this rubbish again, and I speed through it. So when I read the book, I, I didn't think it was strong on evolution, but then I realised I'd speed read those bits. But what amazed me was he also went to foot doctors and he analysed the foot, the, the way the foot is made, and he said... The foot was designed, and I thought, make up your mind, mate. Are you an evolutionist or creation? Who designed the foot? <laughs> he said the foot was designed to strike on the, on the ball of the foot with the toes. And it is, because if you run barefoot on grass, you will never heel strike. Your body won't let you because it'll jar the whole body. 
And yet the joggers that people buy, how many heels strike? And that's what this uh, Christopher McDougall came to the conclusion that all of his problems were because he heel striked. So Abibi Bakila with his barefoot running and also he found other people who barefoot run. And out of his book, which became a bestseller, came the barefoot running craze. So you can buy barefoot running shoes now. You can even buy shoes that have got toes. And I said to one lady, how do you, how, what about socks? She said, oh, you, you can buy socks with toes. <laughs> and they're, and they're, they're thinner sold. I think if you're gonna be climbing up rocky mountains, they wouldn't be that good. You'd want, you'd want some boots on for that, but for running. And so the first thing I did when I'd read this book was went out and I bought some thin soled uh, barefoot runners. I just do short little bursts of run, but the next day my legs were sore. And I thought, what's this? And that's when I realized you use totally different muscles when you, when you toe strike compared to heel striking. But it was all right, it was only a couple of days before my body certainly uh, adjusted to that. Look how children run. How do they run? On their toes. <laughs> Always on their toes. And look what children do in the playground. They don't jog. They either run for their life or stop. And when I was at school, we used to do um, elastics, where you'd have two girls with the elastics around them, and when it's your turn, you're jumping in and out of the elastics. Or we would do skipping, so when it's your turn, you're skipping, skipping, skipping. And then hopscotch, do you do hopscotch where you've got squares in the ground and you throw a stone and then you hop? <laughs> Looks like the games are universal. It's all interval. Because when it's your turn, you're going fast. Look at soccer. When they hit the goal fast and then everyone's walking back. Basketball, fast, 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 fast. And then everyone's walking back. Let's go to the African plains. No animal jogs. They either run for their life or they stop. So the interval training you see in children, you see in the, in the wildlife. And now the researchers are showing that it's the most effective and most efficient way of getting a fit body. But I think it's an excellent message for today because everyone is busy. So sorry, doesn't matter how busy you are, you've got no excuse now. You just got to find out how to fit it in your day, where to fit it and what, what works for you. And remember, muscle knows no age. Whether you're nine or 90, you can have strong muscle. And for anyone who thinks they're too old, it's time to watch the documentary, which I watched on the plane once, on 100-year-old athletes. 100-year-old athletes. <laughs> so let's become fit, let's become strong, so that we are available for God's work. The physical organism should be carefully preserved and developed. And exercise is the most effective way to develop. Not only the body, but also the mind. Dr. Neil Nedley says when he has a severely depressed schizophrenic patient, he puts them on seven hours of exercise a day. After one week, they're so improved, they can go to a one hour maintenance dose or 50 minutes high intensity interval training. Isn't that incredible? Because what happens when you exercise? Remember the network of capillaries. Fresh supplies of oxygen, fresh supplies of nutrient, fresh supplies of water into the brain, which is where our thought patterns happen and develop. I had a question here. Yeah. yeah. Um, when do you eat your breakfast after the morning exercise or drink water? After the exercise? Yeah, before and after. Never exercise unless you have drunk water because you, you need that. 
So what I do is I rise at five, I walk at six, and between five and six, I've drank often three glasses of water, bit by bit. And then I usually back in the house at half past six, but don't I do 15 minutes? Yeah, but then I dive in the creek. So that brings it to the half hour. I have water when I get back, and then I'm preparing the breakfast, usually do some oil pulling, and then breakfast at seven. So that might not work for you. You've just got to work, you know, you've got to find out what works for you. I was a bumpy day. I was since he was out and so he wanted to run to, run to make his house hot worst. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? The fear started coming and the, the heart was stronger and he was happy. <laughs> that's right, that's right, that's right. The, uh, the endorphins certainly do start spinning. And there's a very famous story of an, of an Australian man. And I heard them tell this story in, um, <clears throat> in the Alabama, um, Alabama clinic. I heard one of the exercise girls tell a story and I said, that's Australian. She said, that's right. There was an Australian farmer who was given six months to live with cancer. And his reaction was to get a wheelbarrow, put a few belongings on it, and walk around Australia. Took him two years. <laughs> when he got back, his wife was there. He said, who's that old lady? <laughs> because of how he felt and what he looked like. And the doctors tested him and he was cancer free. What did he do? He massive amounts of blood, more oxygen. Remember, cancer cannot live in the presence of oxygen. One of our guests said, you want to be careful if this story gets out, there'll be a wheelbarrow traffic jam. <laughs> <laughs> I said, if only. <laughs> if only. So no wonder exercise is often called the forgotten remedy. So. Let me tell you by experience, once you start presenting this, you've got to be able to do it. <laughs> you cannot present an exercise uh, lecture unless you're doing it. And so it's, it's time to start training. So I think we can call it, call it a morning. You've um, sat long and well. And I'll finish with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we come to you to thank you once again, to thank you for fearfully and wonderfully making us. It is a marvellous creation and that our souls know right well. Father, teach us and show us how we can each preserve and develop our body that we may be effective and efficient workers for you so we can do our part in hastening your soon coming is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.